join us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Mobley, the current past president for Division 17. You'll notice I'll be looking down at my iPhone to give my introduction. This afternoon, I have the distinct honor and privilege to introduce our current 2015 president, Dr. James, better known as Jim, Lichtenberg, who will deliver his presidential address momentarily. Jim is Emeritus Professor of Counseling Psychology in the Department of Psychology and Research and Education, who retired in May 2015 after 40 years. Jim also served as the School of Education's Associate Dean for Graduate Programs and Research during his tenure at KU. He has previously held the position of the Director of the University Counseling Center and as the Director of Training for Doctoral Programs in Counseling Psychology. Jim may be one of the longest serving training directors in our sort of profession. This may seem odd or strange to many of us in this room today. However, it's less so to those of us who may know Jim and his passions. Jim values the philosophy, mission, and goals relative to training and preparing counseling psychologists. He has been actively engaged in the development of training models and competencies, including master's level trainees. Consistent with his passion, he has chaired our Division 17 Education and Training Committee, was vice president for science, chaired the executive board of the sorry, chaired the executive board of the Council of Counseling Psychology Training Programs and served on and chair APA's Commission on Accreditation. Indeed, Jim has devoted decades with colleagues in SCP and members of APA, influencing our approach and accomplishments towards the provision of doctoral training. In this process, he has maintained a balanced perspective on science and practice. His commitment to practice is evident by his membership in Division 29, which is psychotherapy, the Association of Psychological Science, APS, and the Kansas Psychological Association, KPA. Within KPA, he has served twice as chair of the Ethics Committee and as a member of the KPA Board of Governors. In this regard, Jim has offered significant contributions for and two psychologists in the state of Kansas. Jim's second passion is his commitment and mentorship of students across the decades. He has championed the scientist practitioner model and his approach to engaging students. And in the past six to seven years, while working with Jim and SCP, I've heard several students recall their experiences in the classroom with Jim noting his meaningful and, I use this term, quote unquote, quirky style of engaging them in thoughtful and thought provoking and critical thinking relative our, to our discipline. This word quirky represents my, characterization, my characterization to their experiences of Jim, as I said, because I have observed and experienced this unique aspect and style of his engagement within SCP. Quirky meaning something seemingly strange, odd, or unusual, but yet quite cool. <laughs> For me, this captures Jim's approach to humor and wit, which is unpredictably delivered. Sometimes in midstream of conversations at mid-year or annual convention meetings, it just comes out. <laughs> And after six or seven years, it's honestly taken me that long. It's something that when it pops up, it's less jarring for me today. However, yet, it's still confusing. <laughs> as I've tried to fully understand the context for such humor being interjected into conversations about bylaws or the budget, <laughs> or sometimes critical issues facing our society, APA, or a modern day US society. In closing, I want to express my appreciation and gratitude to Jim for his efforts to address and respond to such critical issues we have experienced as a community 
particularly during the past two years. The shooting death of Michael Brown, the Hoffman Report, the Orlando Massacre, were just a few of the critical issues that has occurred during his presidency. And Jim probably got this information or advice when he became president, that you should always expect the unexpected, that there's gonna be at least two or three critical issues that come up during your presidency that you'll have to respond to unexpectedly. It's these issues that have challenged us as a society in terms of the ongoing acts of violence and killings of black and brown men, as well as women. The Black Lives Matter movement that's helped to highlight and showcase these issues for us as a society, as a nation. And as well as the human torture issue that became even more prominent and evident for us through the Hoffman Report. I value Jim's effort to engage, to critically reflect, both on a personal and professional level, and take into consideration multiple perspectives, multiple social cultural identities, and his capacity to connect with SCP members. At this time, it is my honor again and pleasure to introduce to you Jim as he comes forward to deliver his presidential address. Michael's comment about expect the unexpected, that certainly was characterized uh, this past year for me and um, in at least two ways. One, just all the stuff that's gone on that we've had to deal with, but secondly because um, I'm not sure exactly where we are, but I'm a big fan of Big Brother and uh, on that you know you're supposed to expect the unexpected and uh, sometimes life does feel like a reality TV show. Well, thank you, Michael, for the, for the very kind introduction and um, the stuff you were able to pull together uh, was, was kind of nice. And I want to thank you all for, um, um, in the audience, I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Do I have to start all over? Okay, no, I want to thank, my, so thank you, Michael, for the introduction and thank you, each of you in the audience, for attending this session. I know that there are other interesting and important sessions, although we haven't scheduled them within Division 17, but sessions you could be attending at this particular point in time. As a, as a program, we um, carve this time out and kind of reserve it for uh, SCP activities specifically, but there's lots of stuff that goes on at conventions and I appreciate you being here. Um, uh, especially given the innocuous title of uh, my presentation, at least as it appears, it was Reflections. It's not a uh, particular grab, not much of a grabber of a title. And for some of you, uh, it may seem downright odd because I think I'm frequently perceived as someone who is not especially um, reflective. But there is much about my life, uh, about my relationships and my profession uh, on which I reflect, some things more especially as a result of my involvement in the, in the division. And I want to share a bit of that this afternoon, a bit of those reflections. But as a transition, it'll seem like a long transition, but as a transition into that, I'd like to share a bit of my background with you. I am not going to talk about my family as part of that background, my wife Rosemary, my longtime companion and pet turtle Toad, uh, who next month, get this, who next month celebrates her 49th year with me as a pet. Uh, it's, longer, it's longer than I've known my wife. Uh, and, um, or my dog Cooper, who's brand new to me. I'm also not going to talk about growing up in Columbus, Ohio and choosing not to go to Ohio State University. And I'm also not going to talk about how I, and this is a true story, how I almost killed my dissertation advisor and his uh, wife with a snowmobile. <laughs> and related to that same instance, I'm not going to talk about how difficult it is to do counseling when your mouth is wired shut uh, after breaking it in a snowmobile accident. Although I expect there are those here who supervise and would like to hear about that as a kind of creative and possibly useful uh, psycho uh, supervisory intervention. Rather, this is the snippet I would like to share um, with you uh, about uh, part of my career. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, that was a period of seismic social unrest and change within the US, there was considerable concern 
and discussion within the American Association for Counseling and Development, which was previously called the American Personnel and Guidance Association, or APGA, and now is called the American Counseling Associ Association, or ACA, and also within the, the APA regarding issues of sex bias and sexual stereotyping in counseling and psychotherapy. As a result of those concerns and issues, and to address them, a flotilla of task forces and committees were established and funded within both organizations. Those legacies are still with us. In 1981, when I was a fairly new faculty member, I was invited by the then editor of the Journal of Counseling and Development con to contribute to the journal by providing an occasional column, one that summarized counseling research uh, related um, counseling-related research that those devoted rather exclusively to JCD, the Journal of Counseling and Development, might miss. I was also asked to suggest implications for that research, and I'd like to tell you about my first and only such column in that journal. In 1977, kind of by way of background, Mary Lee Smith and Jean Glass published their highly influential meta-analysis on the outcome of psychotherapy. That article, which appeared in the American Psychologist, while not being the first to suggest the equivalence of diverse approaches to counseling and psychotherapy, or the importance of common factors in those outcomes, was an extremely significant one in terms of jumpstarting empirically what counseling psychology has embraced as the model of how therapy really works. The subsequent meta-analytic deconstruction of psychotherapy outcomes by Wampold a good friend of mine, and more recently by Wampold and Immel, um, credit this earlier work. In 1980, that same Mary Lee Smith, who had published with Jean Glass, published another meta-analysis, this time in Psychological Bulletin. This time her article was about sex bias in counseling and psychotherapy. Shortly prior to that, Bernard Whiteley uh, published a similar comprehensive uh, but non-meta-analytic review in the same journal. Uh, Whitley's paper was on sexual stereotyping in therapy, an issue that had been raised in, uh, in a critical paper by Broverman and colleagues in 1970. Certainly, sex bias and sexual stereotyping in therapy are important, indeed critical concerns for the profession, if and when they occur. But both studies, Meta-analytic study and the other comprehensive review found, found that the evidence for profession-wide bias, sex bias, and sex role stereotyping in counseling was weak at best. Smith's analysis went on to conclude that the evidence actually tended to support bias against men rather than women, that when bias was found, it tended to be in early studies, not in more recent studies, and that bias against women in therapy, when found, was most often found in more poorly designed studies rather than in more rigorous, rigorously controlled studies. Further, she found that studies reporting sex bias against women in therapy were more likely to be published than those that did not find such bias, despite the poorer designs suggesting possible editorial bias favoring findings of sex bias against women. I found all that quite interesting, and the deconstruction and, or disaggregation of research studies through meta-analysis to, um, to be exciting. I didn't then, and I don't now, think I had any sort of ax to grind with regard to either sex bias or sex role stereotyping, although perhaps I should have. I just thought it was interesting and important information to share, information addressing an important contemporary issue in counseling and psychotherapy. Also, the methodology, meta-analysis, was still quite new in 1980, and it too seemed interesting and important uh, to showcase. And I'll admit, in a somewhat snarky and cocky sort of way, that I figured the readership of JCD was probably not going to be reading Psychological Bulletin, and that it was unlikely to be aware of any of this, the methodology or the findings. I shared a draft of my summary with two, with, uh, of these two research articles with a colleague uh, at Kansas and asked if he could help me think through the, uh, the discussion of the implications of these findings. We concluded that we, we included in that discussion a questioning of the relevance of all those AACD committees and task forces that had been established to address the problem that, uh, that now, at least empirically, appeared to be a non-issue at least if the research evidence were to be believed. To 
cap that off, I titled the paper, Much Ado About Nothing, with a question mark and with apologies to Shakespeare. It was a smart-ass title, but not intended as a gig of this feminist and professional issue. Very important issue. I, I did think the title to be a bit provocative, and I hoped it would attract readers and possibly start some discussion. The paper was published. Uh, to this day, I have trouble believing I actually wrote that piece. More to the point, I have trouble believing that, the title, that I titled the article the way I did. And it surprises the hell out of me that having done so, I'm standing here before you. <laughs> the paper met my expectations in, in terms of attracting readers and starting discussion, leading to some interesting professional exchanges in both JCD and, J, and TCP. It also led to some direct interpersonal challenges. One was from a fellow faculty member in my department who challenged me on the Smith finding that the empirical evidence for sex bias had declined over the 15 years of research that her meta-analysis considered. He argued that rather than therapists having become more professionally sensitive to issues of sex bias and sexual stereotyping in their practice, thereby creating the apparent decline in its presence in more recent research, we had simply gotten better at concealing that bias and fooling researchers. On another occasion, during a visit to my graduate school alma mater, the University of Minnesota, a former supervisor in what was then the Student Counseling Bureau took me aside and railed at me, this, and it comes close to a quote, how could you publish that? Even if it were true, having it out there sets the movement back years. I clearly had not considered the political implications of that paper. As I mentioned, that was the only one of those research summaries uh, I wrote for that journal. Make of that what you will. However, a few years later, I was asked to take another stab at writing a column for the journal. This column uh, that ran for a couple of years and was to be, was to be a short op-ed piece that appeared in each issue of the journal. Um, in the very first of those columns, I reflected on my earlier article in which I summarized two reviews of the research on sex bias and sex role stereotyping in counseling. Although perhaps I shouldn't have been, I never, uh, shouldn't have been, I nevertheless had been puzzled by their reactions to the Much Ado article. And so in the first of my columns, in this, the new columns, I talked about what people do, even as scientist practitioners, when the research evidence or logic runs counter to their personally held beliefs, um, which is how I construed the reactions to my article and to those of uh, Whitley and Smith. Now there's good social psychology that helps us understand what happens when facts and beliefs don't fit nicely. I won't dilate on those at this time, but suffice it to say that beliefs not only can survive powerful logical and empirical challenges, but they may in fact be bolstered by evidence that otherwise uncommitted observers would likely agree, likely demands some weakening of them. Indeed, they can even survive the total destruction of their original evidentiary base. This same social psychological research fur further suggests that when the evidence or logic is when the evidence or logic is mixed, attitudes and beliefs are apt to become more strongly polarized. Not only are the sides in a dispute or disagreement likely uh, to accept more or less any evidence that seems to support their position, but they are also likely to offer every possible challenge to any evidence that supports their opponent's view, a point that should not be lost on us during this presidential election year campaigning. As individuals, and importantly as a collective of counseling psychologists, as members of our division, SCP, we hold strong views and beliefs about many things. But in particular, as counseling psychologists, we hold beliefs and attitudes about what is right and wrong, good and bad, about our science, about our practice, about our training, and about social issues and social welfare, so human welfare. And on those issues, our views are, are or are likely to be mixed. On an intellectual level, I think this is good on all fronts. Organizationally, it sometimes feels less so, as it would be nice to be able to speak as one voice on these sorts of matters. Now, although I would enjoy thoroughly talking about the mix of, and the diversity of views on our science, 
on our practice and training issues, what I want to address uh, now is our generally strong but mixed views on social issues. But first, a little bit of history. And secondly, a glass of water. As most of you know, the APA was founded in 1892 by G. Stanley Hall. It was organized to represent what was then the new and developing field of psychology. As that field developed as a scientific discipline, so did its applications, including those clinical applications of the new psychology. Over time, the applied and clinical members of the association grew dissatisfied with the APA, believing that it failed to provide an outlet for discussions of professional practice, as meetings of the APA were devoted exclusively to the presentation of scientific papers. And so in 1937, the clinical practitioners and other applied psychologists within the APA, as well as from outside of the APA, branched off and formed a separate Associ American Association of Applied Psychology, AAAP. The absence of a unifying organization for psychologists became problematic during World War II, particularly with respect to the profession's efforts to coordinate psychological services in the United States. Um, in response to this situation, the AAAP and APA merged again into a single professional organization in late 1945. The resulting association, the new APA, was organized around an increasingly di di diffuse view of psychology, one encompassing not only the study and advancement of psychology as a science, but also the professional practice of psychology and, significantly, issues regarding the promotion of human welfare. This diffusion of psychology was reflected in the new APA's division structure. In it, members could join interest groups for, or divisions in which they could find others with whom they shared common professional interests. APA approved, some of you know, 19 initial divisions, with the two largest being clinical psychology and personnel guidance psychology, both of these being primarily practice divisions. The personnel guidance psychologists um, established themselves as the Division of Counseling and Guidance, and later became the Division of Counseling Psychology and now our Society, for Counseling Psych Psych Society of Counseling Psychology. It's been my experience, and I've been most acutely sensitive to this during this past year, that the strength of SCP, certainly its vocal strength, has been related to and publicly dominated by matters of the promotion of human welfare and social justice, more so than to the study and advancement of psychology as a science or the advancement of the professional practice of psychology writ large. But unquestionably, we have real and exceptional division strengths with regard to science and practice and training. And our division annually recognizes and did this morning colleagues who work represents the best of science and the best of practice in counseling psychology. And our sister organization, CCPTP, recognizes individuals for their lifelong contributions to education and training in psychology. But even a cursory examination of our, our division newsletter, our web page, our listserv, and blog entries and discussions, and our, division, and our division's journal show a marked public and professional presence and activism with respect to a focus on human welfare and, human justice, and social justice issues, much more so than with regard to the science of psychology and of counseling psychology professional practice or training. And although other divisions, indeed the APA organization as a whole, are sensitive and attentive to social justice issues, as a division, we unabashedly claim as a core value a focus on social justice and advocacy for just causes that promote welfare of others, the welfare of others. And further, we argue that this is a defining characteristic of our profession and one that differentiates us from other specialties in applied psychology. I want to say, and I feel a need to say, that I am proud of that, of our division, <clears throat> of our stance. Although I will admit, this is not what attracted me to counseling psychology back in 1969 when I applied for and entered graduate school. But as I've participated in division discussions, 
and in the crafting of division position statements and letters regarding social events, social justice, and calls for social and criminal justice reform, I have been struck by a diversity of positions and perspectives within this core value that we champion. I have also been challenged by the responses of members within the division that have been shared with me, often but not always by email, um, when they find that their strong opinions and or views on events and issues and on our profession are not necessarily shared by others, much less everyone in our division. That there is a diversity of views on social justice issues within the division or on the prominence of this core value relative to the other, several other core values we articulate as a profession should not be surprising. Although we share a common background in training and counseling psychology and in that regard are, are part of the same club, our individual communities and personal and professional life experiences and interests are as diverse as those of the clients and students we serve. We are not the ide ideologically and politically homogeneous group of professionals that we sometimes believe and present ourselves to be, and our personally held views on and responses to social issues are not always shared by others within the division. And it troubles me and I know it has troubled others in SCP leadership positions, that these differences have, on occasion, led to threats and sometimes actions to sever relations with SCP and the APA because of differences of opinion on matters or because of things said or not said by another member or members of the division, uh, which in turn have led to negative attributions about the person or persons and which have then been generalized to the division or to its leadership as a whole. Such reactions and positioning has not, to the best of my knowledge, ever characterized the differences uh, in our beliefs or opinions about the ways we approach our science, our practice, or our education and training. Although differences in ideologies in these areas can be quite striking, and the discussions and arguments concerning these matters quite heated. I've reflected on this particular area of diversity, a diversity of social and at times political opinion, values, and actions, and I found myself turning more to matters of moral philosophy uh, than to psychology. I shared some of my thinking and reflection on this matter in a column I was asked to prepare for the student affiliate newsletter. Um, and I like to, and because I suspect a large number of you haven't seen that, I would like to share some of that with you now after another drink of water. When discussing with colleagues and friends issues that call for moral and ethical judgments and actions, social justice being one of those, it seems to me that those of us in counseling psychology may, and I suspect do, find ourselves torn between two conflicting and I think mutually exclusive moral perspectives or intuitions. The first, first perspective or moral intuition is that, there are action th is that there are actions that are right and others that are wrong universally. With particular regard to social justice, the notion is that people everywhere are harmed if they are mistreated in certain ways or if they lack but could, be, but could have access to certain basic conditions for living well, even if only minimally, things like food, shelter, and a range of resources, services, and opportunities. As individuals, even when bound together as counseling psychologists, we may find ourselves disagreeing about which ways people ought, to, ought not to behave, about how they should or should not be treated, and about which resources, services, and opportunities are universally basic and should be afforded to everyone. But there is nevertheless the shared belief that within this perspective, there are right answers to moral and social justice questions and right positions with respect to social justice matters. On some level, I think this stance, uh, on some level, this is the stance that I think characterizes counseling psychology. But I may be wrong. I say I may be wrong about counseling psychology's subscription to that first perspective because the second but conflicting perspective also seems to characterize counseling psychology. This other perspective is captured by the question, who are we to judge other cultures? 
Who are we to apply our standards to adherence of other moral or religious systems? After all, they may not agree with, uh, agree with us about what are right and wrong ways of behaving. They may not agree uh, that what we take to be harmful is harmful, or they may not agree with us on what are the preconditions that are essential for every worthwhile human life. The first perspective leads us to make moral judgments. The other perspective leads us to abstain from doing so. One presumes that there are moral absolutes. The other claims, uh, views such a claim as presumptuous. The first perspective often, but not always, derives from religious faith or from a belief in natural law, and it is likely to be expressed in terms of human rights. It is, I believe, the perspective that our nation's founding fathers, fathers in quotes, uh, subscribe to. The second perspective leads to moral relativism. Moral relativists recognize a diversity of morals across history and across the contemporary world. Moral relativists, relativists hold that a person's moral views and practices are historically formed um, and local, and except for the accident of one's being born at a given time or at a given place, their views would have or could have been other than they are. Consequently, moral judgments are relative to their time and place, they cannot, and they cannot be objectively justified, and so cannot be absolute. Moral relativists further hold that we cannot step outside of our moral world, which is only one among many, and so to morally judge others is ethnocentric or morally imperialistic or both. The disparity between moral universalists and moral relativists is, I think, central to some of the most divisive public issues of our time. With growing mass immigration, moral relativism also often inspires policies of, uh, and legal arguments of multiculturalism in the name of respecting other communities and traditions. The conflict between moral, um, between moral universalism and moral relativism also figures into debates about how to respond to terrorism and to religious extremism within our own country and abroad. And it enters into uh, the policies of human rights, social justice, and humanitarian interventions. In this way, we in counseling psychology and as a division are not immune to the conflict between moral universalism and moral relativism. As individuals, as counseling psychologists, and as a, as a divisional collective of members of the APA, we struggle with the implications of both perspectives and with the conflict between them. Such struggle is healthy for us as individuals, I think, as professionals and as a profession, at least so long as we can listen and avoid disparaging and denigrating individuals whose philosophies and moral perspectives differ from our own. I don't see a need to resolve the conflict in perspectives, and I don't think we can. It's a philosophical conundrum. But our perspectives and intuitions regarding moral judgments about right and rights, about wrong and wrongs, cannot help but affect our choices of practices, positions, and actions as professionals and as a profession. My hope and wish for our division is that we can be as respectful and accepting of moral and philosophical and political differences on social issues while still vigorously debating them as we are with regard to differences in perspective on our science, our practice, our education and training, and with regard to other types of individual differences that we celebrate. The end. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure I'm glad, glad I got that said and that's over with. Um, it's much more fun to teach than it is to talk like this. Um, we have a business meeting in about 20 minutes. It'll be in the same room.